You're listening to the Lawyers with Purpose Practice Success Podcast, hosted by Lisa Rozier, featuring attorney Dave Zampano, along with frequent guests. Whether you're a seasoned estate planning attorney, an attorney looking to add estate planning and elder law to your existing list of practice areas, or you're just starting out, this podcast will give you a solid plan for success. Listen now as Dave and his guests share their personal journeys to practice success and the insights they learned along the way. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Practice Success Podcast. I'm Lisa Rozier with Dave Zampano, and our special guest today is Alay Yajik from Law Firm Success Group. Did I, did I do that right? Did I say that right? Yajnik. 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 Well, thank you for joining us today. Glad to, glad to have you with us. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and uh, I've had the opportunity to meet L.A. before, and um, I found his conversation uh, so unique that I thought he would be a great guest for our Practice Success Podcast. Um, obviously, uh, LA, we, you know, we, we, we cater to lawyers in the typically the estate planning, asset protection, and Medicaid planning fields, um, but we're not limited to that. We have a lot of other lawyers that listen we may be interested in going to a different area of law where, where you can actually maybe be some help because you don't focus on any particular type of law, but you focus really on the elements that make law firms successful, which is really interesting because this is called the Practice Success Podcast. So who better to have on than the Law Firm Success Group? Why don't you take a moment to share a little bit about your story and how you came to be uh, what you're doing currently? Sure. Thank you, Dave. Really appreciate that wonderful introduction. And uh, and by the way, I'm sure we'll have in the show notes, but I had Dave and Guy on the Lawyer Business Advantage podcast a few yeah. months ago. That's where we met and uh, and have had built a really nice relationship from there. So what we do at Law Firm Success Group is we're really dedicated on help to help uh, the owners of really small law firms. Think two partners or less. Could be uh, any practice area. And if you think about what happens with a lot of these folks is they're in big law, they're doing really well, but they're working too many hours, they're unhappy with the kind of work they're doing. There's a whole host of reasons why they oftentimes leave big law and they go to start their own firm. And usually a big part of that is they think, my gosh, I'm paying all this money in overhead. Well, if I have my own firm, I can just keep all that money. It would be so nice and so wonderful. And I don't have to work as hard and all these other benefits stack up. And then they go to launch their firm and they find that they're working way more hours than they expected because now they're a business owner and they have to wear all these hats. They have to either hire people, hire the right people, or they have to do the work themselves. They have to put in systems. They have to do all the marketing. They don't have the resources that they're used to be doing. They're sending out invoices at 11 o'clock at night. It is not the situation that they want. And what we found, as I think what you have found as well, Dave, is that when you take a practice, you have a really strong vision for what that practice can be. And then you achieve that vision through a strategy, so, you know, solid marketing plan and business development skills, really good people and good systems. That promise, that, that reason why that attorney left Big Law to start their firm, that promise actually comes true. They're making more money. They're taking more time off. They're working with better clients and they're just having more fun. And that's what we're dedicated to doing at Law Firm Success Group. We work with these clients all across the country and we provide exclusively one-on-one -on -one business coaching for those clients. Yeah, what I love about um, the synergy, uh, obviously we here at Lawyers With Purpose, uh, I was strongly influenced uh, really transformatively uh, in 1999 from reading the book, The E-Myth by Michael Gerber, you know, the pie maker and, and the idea of systems and processes. Um, so back then, by reading this book, I started just every quarter building a new system and process in my estate planning, asset protection, and, you know, Medicaid planning law firm. And as I continued to build these, they all started to kind of play on each other. And I had a model that other lawyers started saying to me, hey, I want that. H how do I get that? And that's how Lawyers with Purpose was born by a single individual myself um, using his team and, and having focused goals to build systems and processes. Now, one of the things I always say, uh, LA, that I think is so critical is 
having the tools is critical. Having the systems, the processes is, is great. But but we we always say there's four pillars. Um, first pillar is you actually have to know what you're doing legally. So you have to have that legal knowledge that you know you 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 can't, it's kind of hard to fake it till you make it in law uh, because there's real consequences. Um, the second element uh, is really what we call value creation. And, and really that has two sides to that coin. Value creation to the world, meaning as you convey out your message, does the world resonate with it to the, to the level where they actually call you? So the real world, world would call that marketing, right? Do you have a value proposition that, that makes people react to it and call you? The second side of that coin is again, value proposition. But this time, once you're individual with, once you're with this prospect, to be able to show them the individual value you can create specifically for them. That's what we call the sales, right? So, but we, we call that value creation because that's really what that's all about in our world here at LWP. The third element is really about operational efficiency, but we actually call it proficiency because efficiency we believe is a failed model, right? Efficiency uh, is about doing things well and quickly and in, in, in less time and a better product. But, but doing that doesn't always lead to profit. And we like efficiency that leads to profit. That's where I think you really have a lot of support and input on, on how to help people understand those business elements of operations, um, financials, things of that nature. And then finally, the fourth pillar we talk about is building a company culture um, and, and building a team. So building a team and company culture that all work together. Over, over, over encompassing all of those, I think, is, is the jewel that you work with. And again, I'll let you uh, comment on my thoughts, my four pillars, and on this, that really comes down to mindset. Um, are we able to flex our brains? Uh, you know, we've been trained very critically in law school, and uh, some of us get stuck there and never leave it. And uh, so I think you have that beautiful work of remolding thinking processes of attorneys into these other things that we learned in e-myth and things. What say you around all that? Yeah, I think I love the framework, the four pillars. That's really easy to understand. And uh, each of those pillars, there's a massive, massive amount of stuff that goes into each of them. But in order to be successful, the attorney needs to have the right mindset to seize all of those things and capitalize on all that opportunity. What I really like about your approach is it's super dialed in. Um, one of the, you know, we have, we do a lot of similar things. We also do things, I think, pretty differently. One right. of the things I really like about your model is it's really, really scripted out. It's super detailed. An attorney can come in and plug in and just do all the things you tell them to do. You give them all the systems, all the processes, everything they need to be successful, and then coaching along the way. Our model is a little bit different. Uh, we have a wide range of tools and processes and systems. And so what we're doing when we talk to our clients, our clients don't want to do to follow other people's processes. They want to kind of do their own thing. And so we really enjoy working with them to figure out what they want to do in their firm, the changes they want to make, the kind of firm they want to build, and then helping them do that. Whether it's, hey, you know what? I want to work. I want to work, but I want to work in Europe three months out of the year. My practice is in California. Or it's just, you know, an estate planning attorney and a family law attorney in Boston who have just left their respective firm to join forces and start a law firm. And they want to really keep a really strong community focus. Um, we love helping attorneys build their perfect practice. And, uh, and it's a lot of fun. Well, it sounds like you're kind of there to guide the lawyer who doesn't have someone who's already gone and built everything to really help them understand what do you want to build? How do you want to build it? You have a couple books to your credit. Why don't you take a minute and talk about those? Yeah. So uh, thank you for the, thank you for the opportunity. The, the book I have is Staffing Up. It's the first book written that teaches attorneys how to hire attorneys and staff. And people ask, LA, you're a business, you're a law firm growth guy. Why are you writing a book on staffing? Well, as it turned out, my clients were having a ton of success on marketing and business development. And very quickly, we hit a ceiling. And we realize that they can't grow anymore until they start to hire some people. But they didn't know how to do that. They didn't know the right person to hire, when to hire them, how to interview them, how to onboard and train them. And so uh, staffing up the Attorney's Guide to Hiring Top Talent, which is available on Amazon as a paperback or an audiobook, uh, teaches them to do all of that. It's a very short read. You can read it in you know less than two hours. 
Um, and it's just packed with information. It's a manual for hiring either attorneys or staff. Yeah, we find, um, we have found, you know, we've been working with lawyers across the country for, for 20 years now, and we have found certain metrics to be true. And so we built three models around those metrics. We didn't fight it. We just went with what the data told us. And what we found was that in businesses, I'd love your input on this because you're, you're, you're dealing with people from, I'm going to call it infancy. And when I mean infancy, I don't necessarily mean the size of the firm. I mean, their mindset around running a business called a law firm. Um, we found that there's three key models. The first model was what we call profitable level. The, the law firms traditionally first really struggle at becoming profitable. They live by what we call money in the checkbook rule. Well, should I do this advertising campaign? Well, I don't know. Do I have money in the checkbook? If it's there, I'll do it. If it is, and I don't. And then is there enough money to pay me and my staff? I mean, most people during those early stages, they, they, they don't even know if they're going to have enough money to pay the cash flow of the things on a week-to-week -week basis. And that's, that's very stressful and hectic. And so really our first goal is to get them really systematized and standardized. So they understand what generates a lead, how many leads they need to generate a dollar, how many dollars, you know, based on X, how many meetings we have, you know, color coded calendaring system, things of that nature. Those help get law firms profitable. We find once they get profitable, then they start to grow. So when they're in that small infancy phase, it's usually the attorney themselves. And then they start to add their first or second staff. That's why that staffing up number or book sounds so intriguing to me because we we work so much with our attorneys. Same thing, understanding how and when to hire. Interesting, and I'd love your perspective on this one as well. Most lawyers want to hire another lawyer first, which is like the worst thing to do, um, right? To get that staff in place. And then I'll, I'll, I'll figure out my three phases and I'll let you take the rest of the conversation. So phase two is really about taking, phase one is getting profitable by implementing systems processes and reliability. You can start to predict, get some predictability and efficiencies in that practice. So there's consistent regular cash flow. We find once lawyers do that, they tend to grow. And that's what we call the robust phase where they start adding staff where or or even associates where they start to say, okay, I figured out the systems. I figured out what we're doing. We figured out how we're doing it. Now we just want to do more of it. And that's really when they grow in their internal uh, organization. And then finally, they hit another level and we have very specific metrics around each of these levels. Um, then they hit what we call the e-freedom phase, entrepreneurial freedom, where um, our most successful members have law firms that actually operate without them. And you've seen this a lot of times with the senior partners and things like that. But we've been able to bring that down to a small law firm level where the owner attorney can get significant freedom working only in the areas where they're exceptional at and where they really love and are passionate about. Well, that's um, that's exactly what yeah. it's all about, right, Dave? Yeah. It's about freedom and flexibility. It used to be about just money, right? How much money can I earn? How much money can I earn now? Things have changed and people want to, they want to have the flexibility to take time off, to not be shackled to their desk. And I love that approach. It makes a lot of sense. You know, um, one of the things that we like to do when we're working with non-estate planning firms, their first hire is oftentimes that attorney, like a family law firm, um, because that uh, associate attorney can then come in and and free up the the partner to do other things. Um, but I love your approach about starting off and making sure the firm is profitable. Because when we're working with an attorney, they're oftentimes saying, my firm is profitable. And we say, really? Well, what if you paid yourself as an employee? Not, not the money <laughs> you're making now, but what if you assign yourself an hourly rate and paid yourself as an employee like you would if you're an employee at another firm? And they look at it and they go, well, okay, I'm paying myself. So what? So now how much profit do you have in your firm that's left over after you pay yourself as an attorney? And they say, well, very little. I said, yeah. So what you're telling me is the only reason the firm is profitable is because you're doing all the work. <laughs> exactly. You're <laughs> really a grunt. You're a high yeah. paid grunt. Yeah. yeah. And that's uh, so how you get to entrepreneurial freedom is, is through others. And so Ali, ask me, the, uh, let me, I, I have a question for you. I, I've always, in the research I've always done, I've always found that in traditional law firms, like the larger law firms, the, the metrics have been uh, three or four attorneys per staff. And what's interesting in the model we built at Lawyers with Purpose is the exact opposite. We've built a model that's three or four staff per attorney. What's been your experience out there? How, how are you coaching and mentoring attorneys in this area? Yeah, I think for estate planning, uh, your model makes a lot more sense. I, I don't know why um, an estate planning firm 
traditional firm, unless they're doing a lot of really, really complex work, why they would have that big lot type of model. Yeah, it makes sense to have one attorney have at least two staff uh, up to, I would say, maybe four. Beyond that, it starts to transition into a bit of a different challenge. Where now, they have, now they have to manage a team. Yeah. Sometimes they're better off having a senior paralegal, you know, manage the staff for them. That's so funny because that's our model. You, you, you see, this shows me that it's the models are, are, are reliable on data because when we go from that profitable model to robust, that's exactly the whole focus is getting the lawyer relief in what we call the middle two columns. So operating a firm, we say has four columns. You need your marketing, right? You need your marketing expertise. You need your legal work that you do. That's the product you get paid for. You need your client services that services them. And then you need your HR and payroll, right? Those are your four, your four, your four elements of running a business. And the lawyer in the profitable level is doing all four of them. When we go to the robust, it's that internal person that rises up and takes over those middle two columns. They manage and make sure all the legal work's getting done and they make sure all the client services is done. We call that a DO, a director of operations. And then the attorney still will manage then that DO and still usually have their hand in finance and HR, which is typically outsourced in the smaller firm. And then they're still doing the marketing, which I'm gonna say at best is haphazard. And then as they get to that robust, I'm sorry, to the freedom level, they actually free themselves of all four buckets. And they have what we call a law firm leader who comes in and is actually running the whole law firm, the marketing, the sales, the operations, the legal work, and making sure it gets out timely and effectively, and the HR and finance. Um, what's been your experience out there in, in this you know, kind of evolution of growth in a firm? Anything different? Or would you highlight any maybe more details around that? I think the only uh, the only thing I would maybe think about is, uh, and again, for estate planning, I think this model makes a ton of sense. The I wouldn't change. I yeah. would not change a thing. Yeah, but right. for litigation, we look at maybe some different models where we're yeah. bringing on more attorneys, uh, so it's more attorney heavy. We still have staff, and we're really trying to minimize overheads. So we might start by having, you know, your director of operations. We can call it office manager. We can call it a right. uh, executive director, whatever the the attorney wants to title it. But having that person take a wider operational role and then utilize, I think you're doing the same thing, utilize outsourced services for things like, you know, HR and finance and accounting and those kinds of things. Yeah. Love that. Um, let me ask you this question. Um, marketing, it, it seems to be, and I know uh, my uh, Lisa's waving that we're running down in time, but this is just a great conversation. I want to just drag it out a little bit more because we get, we get experts like you, you know, so infrequently. Uh, marketing. Let's talk a 30 second on marketing. I know Lisa will have an opinion on this at some point in the conversation. Um, what do you find the biggest challenges for small law firms when it comes to a marketing strategy and budget? Yeah, right now, not much because they're, they're all slammed for work. And most all my clients are focused on hiring at this point because they have more work than they can handle. Um, but what I find is they're asking the wrong questions, Dave. So the number one question I get asked about marketing is, hey, Ale, will well, SEO work for me or LA, should I do pay-per-click or LA, should I join another networking group? And it's the wrong question because they don't know what their message is. They don't, <laughs> to your point about value proposition, they don't know what their value proposition is. They don't know what sets them apart in the marketplace, number one. Number two, they don't know who their ideal client is. So they have no idea what their target market is. And so then how can they determine with any degree of accuracy what marketing tactics are going to work? You have to first understand your value proposition, your message. Then you have to understand your ideal client and your target market. Then, and then only, can you talk about what marketing tactics actually work? And once they're done with that, then to your point, we do a two-page marketing plan. I think you probably do something more in depth where we look at, okay, based on those marketing tactics, how many leads do we expect to get? We do a basic sales funnel that predicts the number of clients you know, average dollar per client, we can figure out if they're going to hit the revenue target or not. And the budget is in terms of dollars and in terms of time. So we can go back yeah. and tie that all off to make sure everything lines up. You, these are universal truths, LA. Hearing you say, it's just, we know in my law firm, if we have X number of calls a month, we know we hit revenue. Every time we just know, we know if we have Y number, which is a multiple of that, we know our revenue. We know essentially what the value of a single initial contact is. 
Um, and that's really the magic of business operations, isn't it? I mean, that's really getting clear on, you know, I find people get lost in details and, and they lose the thing that's right in front of them, like a phone call and someone leaves a message and you don't call them back. Uh, you know, you're killing yourself to get a lead. <laughs> that's right. And then you don't return the phone call. It, it just makes no common sense. But people do it all the time. What is I, I have to just you said something that was very what's the word I want to use? Uh, very challenging in a very positive way. You said my clients don't have any of those problems. They have so much business. They don't want to do with it. What do you attribute that to? Uh, I think at least in California, where most of my clients are, most of my clients are on both coasts. They tend to be there. Uh, the economy is just rip roaring. I know we're hearing talks about recession and stuff like that. I am not seeing it yet. Uh, there is a tremendous demand for legal services. I think a lot of there was a lot of pent up demand during COVID. And now that COVID is is you know wrapping up, people are coming out of the woodwork. There's a lot of deals getting done in the M and A space. There's a lot of employment law situations that are going on in California and Massachusetts and New York and places like that. Uh, and you know, un unfortunately, there's a lot of family law cases that are going on too. So there's just a lot of activity in the legal space right now. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think I think all of us need to be aware um, of value creation. Like I say, in our area of law, we we had a panel last week at our semi-annual retreat, and we had one preparing for a recession. You know, how is your how do you recession-proof your practice? And um, in our area, you know, um, Medicaid. There's never a recession in Medicaid. People are falling ill and going to nursing homes every day. There's never a recession in probate. Right? People are dying every day. Um, and so those things are pretty consistent. Where, where it does ebb and flow a little bit is in the estate planning itself, right? Because as like now the markets are down 30%. So people don't feel like they have money, right? They feel like they have less money while less that I have to protect or whatever. But people still do protect in those downtimes. But what we teach is it's actually an opportunity in down markets because now you can convey away money at a shorter penalty. So at the old day, if you had some, if your portfolio account was worth $100,000 and let's make up a number that there was a penalty of one month for every 10,000 you convey. Well, if you conveyed it when it was worth 100,000, you had a 10 month penalty. Now it's only worth 70. So now you only have a seven month penalty. So it's a great advantage to transfer when it's worth 70. So when it goes back up to 100, there's no, there's no transfer penalty for that. So it's really cool opportunities uh, in planning and pre-planning around there. I think likewise in the litigation world, I think as there's more rancor out there in the world, which there seems to be plenty of, I think litigation is, is uh, more sought out as well. People want to be made right. They feel they've been wronged. Um, they've been hurt all kinds of different things, litigation and business, all those different areas. Uh, I think you're right. I think those also, I think those tend to go up during a recession. What's been your experience? Uh, litigation definitely goes up yeah. during a recession. Um, and by the way, that's not my experience. I've been coaching right. attorneys for 10 years, so I've not actually taken my practice through a recession. Right. But in talking to other attorneys, that's what they tell me is that litigation actually goes up. The challenge is it's harder to collect. Because yeah. oftentimes they don't have the money or they don't have enough money. So um, it, it's, it can still hurt. A recession can still hurt. But I'd like to leave your audience with this message. Um, yeah. There's always opportunities, whether it's a recession or boom times, there's always opportunities. And you have to decide as a business owner, because if you own your own law firm, that's what you are. You have to decide as a business owner, are you going to seek out those opportunities during a recession or not? And just know this, that coming out of a recession the strong firms, the well-run firms, the ones in your program, Dave, they they come out stronger. Yeah. And the weak firms either fail or they come out much weaker. So as an attorney entrepreneur, you can decide yeah. which one you want to be. And I want to give you the closing thoughts here, LA, around mindset. Um, what do you think, uh, this is the Practice Success Podcast. What's your piece of advice to the listeners about mindset? Uh to get their practice to their next level of success, whatever that is for them. So, if I was talking to to one of your um, one one of your audience members, I you know here's what I would say, and I guess I am. Uh, you are a business owner. You are, and that's an amazing gift because now you can build the practice that you want. There's no excuses. Whatever you want to achieve in your practice, whether it's income, whether it's time off, whether it's freedom, whether it's flexibility. You can do that. And programs like Lawyers with Purpose give you the tools to make that happen. There has never been a better time in the history of the world to start your own law firm. It is easier than ever. 
And like you and I are talking about, Dave, the best practices are out there and an attorney just needs to, you know, invest in those best practices and make it happen. Yeah. My key takeaway from your conversation, this being the second one with you, you need guidance and support. You need people who can guide you in LA. That, that's really what I think your services at Law Firm Success Group does. And I'd love you just to let our audience know how they can reach you directly if they'd love to chat with you uh, and see how your services might help them, whether they're one of our members or whether they're uh, someone contemplating a different area along. Great. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, just visit lawfirmsuccessgroup.com and uh, all the information is there or you can hit me up on LinkedIn. Uh, my information is in the show notes or you can just uh, on LinkedIn, just search for Law Firm Success Group. Fantastic. Lisa, any closing thoughts? No, I just thoroughly enjoyed that conversation. I didn't participate, but um, I did owe everything that you did say about the marketing because, you know, the marketer and me. Um, (laughs) But no, for our listeners out there, I hope that you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. You can always uh, get additional episodes by going to lawyersofpurpose.com and clicking on the Practice Success Success Podcast. Uh, Dave and Alay, thank you so much for a great conversation today. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Practice Success Podcast. Visit www.lawyerswithpurpose.com slash podcast to listen to other episodes and to subscribe. We'll see you next time.